Good morning. Good morning. Let's see one haircut, two haircuts, three haircuts, four <laughs> haircuts, five haircuts. It's springtime, is that what it is? We're trimming away the, the excess. Let's all stand together. Glad you're here today. Psalm 108 says, This is the day that the Lord has made. And he gave it to you. Amen. He gave it to me. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you today in this place on Gate Street. We are thankful for what you have given to us. We honor you today. We woke up today to worship you, to hear about you, to learn of you, to sit at your feet. We come with joy in our hearts in Jesus' name. Do you agree? Amen.
rejoice with the family today. I got the email and the text last week, but Daryl and Susan Glende are proud new grandparents to another one. Amen. I'm sorry, I don't remember all the names and all the numbers, but that's a guy thing, right? We're just glad that the grandbaby's healthy.
critical snowmobile accidents and Frankie submitted a request for a gentleman whose name again is Dean and we're praying for Dean for full recovery. We were with a man on Friday who was standing on the side of a road of a snowmobile track and some drunk guys came and bashed him and he was so close to death that they were amazed that he lived. But he was hobbling and asked Harvest to pray for him today so that on Tuesday when he goes back that there's improvement. Let's pray for Paul today. Let's pray for John as well who was rushed in this week in an emergency situation.
his heart would not resuscitate. They did get him quickened. His heart did beat. You heard me. You saw the email about that. We prayed for him this week. We'll lift him up. I'd also like to lift up Jason and Rachel Greb to you, who wishes they could be here. It's the last Sunday before they have to travel to China for the adoption of their two children. We lift up the Grebs today. We also want to lift up the, the business that is next door to us, the little learners. I'd like to make requests for them today that the Lord would bless them in their venture. Father, we come before you right now as a church, and we lift our hearts to you, Father, for the full recovery of these men, either in accidents or an attack of the enemy that tried to steal John's life. We believe we receive the healing touch of the anointed Jesus on their life. We still believe in miracles, Lord. We believe that you're able to do what man cannot do. And it comes by corporate faith. It comes by us coming in agreement. Wherever two shall on earth pray as touching anything and agree, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. And as we're praying for healing, Lord, I pray over this prayer cloth for Alan's mom in the name of Jesus. Quickening power. Let your anointing flow to these men and women. Let your anointing flow to these families. Put a cloak of protection on the grebs as they travel and on their children. Cause there to be such a great testimony of your goodness to them, God. Perfect what concerns them. They wish they could be here with us today so we could have prayed over them. But the urgency of their travels have made it impossible. Be with them, Jason and Rachel and Lisa, Jason's sister. And Father, we lift up little learners to you, this company that came in and rented our building next door. We just ask that you would grant favor to them. We ask that you would cause the neighborhood and people to learn about this business so that they would prosper. We give you thanks and praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Before we dismiss the kids, we're going to do a special song that we uh, want to dedicate to our friends. Gordy and Verla Harrell with us today. Would you welcome Arden's parents with us today. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day, He will make a way. He will make a way. Sing it with me if you know it. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me, and he will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side, with love and strength for each new day. He will make a way, he will make a way, because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone 
Because I know He holds the future And life is worth the living Just because He lives Sing that with us Because He lives I can face tomorrow Because He lives all fear is gone because I know He holds the future and life is worth living just because He lives. Children, you can be dismissed to your class right now. God will make a way where there seems to be no way he works in ways we cannot see he will make a way for me and he will be my guide pull me closely to his side with love and strength for each new day he will make a way With love and strength, with love and strength for each new day, He will make a way. He will make a way. One more time. With love and strength for each new day, He will make a way. He will make a He will, huh? I don't know what you're going through today, but hold it up in light of that. He sees it. He's got a plan. Amen. Nothing's a shock to God. And he has a way. We're going to do things a little different today. We're going to save our offering to the end of service because we want to receive a special collection for our guest speaker today. I'll save the announcements as well for the end. You know, I met our friend, Nate Nelson, several years back. People told me that it was a, it was a guy from Hillsdale College that were friends of the Grebs who was going to come and visit our church. And I remember we were meeting at the community center. And at the same time, the Lord spoke to his heart to come and work with our church and our young people simultaneously was speaking to me about him coming and working with our young people 
So it was a divine appointment, and for several years, he was able to, to lead our first youth group back when we were at the community center. We didn't have a midweek location. I think Nate even opened up his apartment for youth meetings. Remember that? And uh, after a season back in Evansville and coming back, we've been very, very blessed to enjoy. And I say this um, with, some, with some thought. Not just enjoy what Nate can do for us, but to enjoy the fact that Nate is our friend. Because Nate is, he is a picture of Jesus as far as his demeanor. I wish I could have a demeanor like him. Like if you filled in the blank, Nate, Brother Nate has blank as a great attribute. We'd all have something to, to fill in. And I was thinking about that before service and last night, and I don't know where this is in the Bible, but the wording that I got to fill in the blank was good-natured. There's just something, Nate, I don't know how you were raised, but it really comes across with such an awesome nature toward everyone you meet. And my kids love you. Our teens love you. I love you as a brother. I am just so thankful that the Lord has allowed you to come and share with us what God's doing in your life, giving it to us, but also just being connected together. Isn't that a blessing? So I've asked Nate to strum up a few notes today and share with us God's word. So let's welcome him as he comes. I got you. Got the water. Testing. Hello. Is this thing on? I don't think it is. I think it's coming. Okay. Okay. Wow. There it is. Thanks for, thanks for making me almost cry while I'm trying to get ready to give a sermon. I appreciate that. Thank you for the words, though. Seriously. Um, okay. Um, Let's, let's do this thing. Um, last, last week was Easter Sunday. We celebrated um, not only Jesus' death, where he died um, for the forgiveness of our sins, but his resurrection, where he conquered death, brought life to us, um, overcame death, and put it under him, um, showing that that was someday what's going to happen to us too. Just as he rose from the dead, uh, we too are going to die someday, but then we're going we're gonna to rise from the dead with him. Um, and that's just a cool, cool thing. I wanted to, to preach. Um, I knew it was going to be right after Easter. So I wanted to hit on something that Jesus did after the resurrection. And there's really not a lot in the Bible that Jesus does during that time. Um, there's, there's a few weeks where he appears to a couple of disciples. Um, but he doesn't, he doesn't preach a whole lot. He doesn't do many healings. Um, sort of that part of his ministry is done. What he does is reconnect with his disciples and the people that he was close with. Um, the first thing he does um, after, after coming out of the tomb is, is he meets Mary Magdalene. She's there at the grave. Um, she doesn't recognize him at first, um, but when she does recognize him, he, just, he simply says her name. He says, Mary. And she looks at him, and when he says her name, she recognizes him as, as Jesus. And she's been told he's come back from the dead, but she sees him and knows it's him. And he tells her, don't touch me yet. I have not yet been to the Father. I've still got to go to the Father and then come back to you. So don't, you, can't, you can't touch me just yet. Um, she wants to come up and give him a hug. And he says, it's not time for that. But go, go into Jerusalem and tell the disciples that I'm going to come see them. Um, he gives her a, a word to have an expectation that he's coming to them. Um, so before they even see him, they get word, not only is he alive, and risen from the dead, but he's coming to see them. Wait for me, I'm coming. Um, he, then, he then reveals himself to two disciples walking along the road to Emmaus. And again, they don't recognize him either. Um, and they're like, 
have you heard about, about Jesus who died and, and now they're saying he's risen from the dead? And he says, you, you have simple hearts. Let me, let me show you about the Messiah. And he reveals what the Old Testament says about the Messiah. He talks about Moses. He talks about the prophets and the rest of the Old Testament scriptures. And he says, this is who the Messiah is, according to the Old Testament. They invite him to come have dinner with them. He breaks bread with them, but he doesn't have wine, which is, which is telling because at the Last Supper, he said, I won't have wine with you until I eat it and until, until we have this food again in my father's fellowship in, in the final kingdom. Um, but he does break bread with them and he eats with them. And then they figure out who he is. As soon as he eats bread with them, they figure it out and then he disappears. Awesome sense of humor. Um, he, then, he then comes to the 11. They're in a locked room and they're waiting for him and he just shows up in the midst of them. Uh, they touch, he, says, he says, touch me. See who I am. Touch my hands, touch my feet. Know that I rose bodily from the dead. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a figment of your imagination. I'm not a trick of the light. I'm not a bit of undigested cheese. I'm the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm, I'm, I'm here, and I'm with you bodily, physically. Here we are. Um, when he meets up with them, he says, peace be with you. And this is something he says almost every time he encounters the disciples. Um, he says, peace be with you. That's the first thing he says to them. Um, he then goes on with those 11 again to talk about how he was in the Old Testament. He shows himself through, through Moses, through the prophets, and, and through other scriptures in the, in the Old Testament. Um, with this group, he then breathes on them, once again says, peace be with you, and tells them to receive the Holy Spirit. Um, so this is now the second time he's given a warning of something coming. Or not a warning, but a, um, an advance notice. Um, to the disciples, first from Mary, Jesus is coming. Secondly, he tells them himself, the Holy Spirit is coming. About a week later, he appears to the disciples with Thomas, who wasn't there the first time. And Thomas has had doubts as to, as to whether or not he's alive. And Jesus again says, Thomas, touch the holes. See that it is me. Um, and Thomas does. And so again, he's showing bodily resurrection. I'm here. I'm walking around amongst you. I am no longer dead. I'm not here as a spirit form. I am here. You can touch me. Um, Thomas believes. Um, he then says, peace be with you, again to Thomas. And then he tells about future believers. He says, blessed are you because you have heard. Blessed even more are those who have not heard and yet will believe. Um, so, so there's this progression that he tells people to expect. I'm coming back. The Holy Spirit is coming. There will be future believers, and they're going to be blessed. Um, last thing he does, one of the last things, is has a, has a little breakfast with some of the disciples. He's on the shore waiting for them. Um, they're out fishing. They don't recognize it's him. He says, are you catching anything? They say, nope. He says, throw your net on the other side. They throw it over, haul in 153 fish. Jesus says, or Peter says, it's the Lord. And he runs into the water, goes up onto the shore. Jesus already has some fish there cooking. But he says, bring some of your fish with you. We're going to put it with my fish. So my fish is mixed with your fish, and we're going to dine on it, and we're going to have breakfast. And again, he eats with them. Um, that's about all he does until the ascension, where he, he gives some final parting thoughts. In that, there's, there's two cases where he preaches about himself from the Old Testament. There's two cases where he says, touch me, shows that he's a real person. But then there's three things that he does three times. He says, peace be with you. He gives predictions of things to come. And he eats with them. He does those three things. Um, and then there's one last three. In that, in that breakfast with Peter, he takes him out afterwards and Peter had denied Jesus three times. Um, Jesus had told him he was going to, and he didn't believe him, but Jesus is always right. Um, Peter's always wrong. Um, and and he, he goes for a walk with him, and he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. And feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Lord, yes, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, really? Do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. And Peter's restored. He has that three... Three times where, where Peter is restored there. 
Um, okay, so now that gets us to, to what we're talking about today, which is one of his final words. As he's getting ready to go, um, this is kind of his last sermon. He's, he's literally getting ready to ascend bodily into heaven. That's such a cool thing, I can't even describe it. Jesus' body still exists. The tomb is empty. Um, he's traveling outer space somewhere. I don't, I don't know if it's an alternate reality, if it's a different plane of reality. I don't know if it's on another planet, but I know his body exists somewhere because it rose up from the dead and then ascended into heaven. But right before he went, he said, Jessica, can I get uh, Matthew 28 up there? Beautiful. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. I'm going to catch on that phrase. Uh, the, next, the next part of this sermon's pretty much a word search. Um, this is phrases of I am with you, or the Lord was with them, or the Lord was with him throughout the Old Testament, because these are all Jews. These guys were raised on the Old Testament scriptures. And I wanted to see the impact of what that word is to them. We hear, I am with you always, and we think, yay, Jesus is still with me. But it's not just him being with them. There's something that comes along with that, and I want to go into that a little bit. Um, we're going to start by looking at a story we're mostly familiar with, um, Joshua. Nope, Joseph, in Genesis 39, Before I get into that, I gotta say this. I don't, <clears throat> I don't know who this message is for, but if you have an inkling it's for you, pay attention, because <laughs> God went to great lengths to get this thing to you, and the enemy has gone to great lengths to stop it from coming. Um, while I was preparing this, I took some time to procrastinate, because I do that, and I have two notebooks with notes that I've taken for, for novels that I want to write in the future. And um, I thought, oh, this is a great time to transfer those notebooks onto a digital copy. And, you know, in case I ever lose my notebooks, I'll still have them on file here. And so while I should have been preparing the sermon, I'm going through my notes and typing them away because that seemed like a good thing to do. And I get to the last page in each of these notebooks, and they have nothing to do with my books they both, the last page of both of these notebooks have to do with this, with this topic that I'm getting ready to prepare. I'm like, okay, Jesus, you're cool. Um, twice during the week, um, a devotional newsletter that I get in the mail, in the email, had to do with this topic, some of these very same verses. Um, so God was sending this, and, and to come against it, Phil can tell you there's been technical difficulties this morning when I woke up and was trying to put some final touches on it and transfer it to a jump drive. My computer crashed. Um, while I was waiting for the computer to reboot and try and get it fixed, I was ironing my pants, and the steamer on the iron um, stopped working. And so I hit the button like three times to force steam out, and it didn't steam out. It shot out a pool of water that <laughs> right in that place where it would think, oh, he had an accident. Um, <laughs> I get here, and the, the, it's on a jump drive, and the computer in the office won't, won't read it. It's a wrong file of, of Word, and so it's just technical stuff. And for the last two days, I've had a hacking cough that, that last night had me hacking every five minutes. Just, and if you guys have heard me hack, it's, it's, it's bad. It's ugly. So if this is for you, I'm, I'm, I'm a little jealous. Okay. Surely, surely I am with you to the very end of the age. Now, variations on this phrase, I am with you, or the Lord was with them, or the Lord was with him, occur about 23 times in the Old Testament. And I want you to see the pattern that comes with this phrase, because it never stops at the Lord was with them. It's the Lord was with them and. So let's look at Joseph. We all know the story of Joseph. Um, Joseph had a dream that he, his brothers were bowing down to him, um, they sell him into slavery. Um, they, they first pretend to kill him, throw him in a pit, then they sell him into slavery. Um, the slave traders um, put him in the hands of a man named Potiphar, um, who notices that the Lord is with him. 
Genesis 39, 2 and 3 says, The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. The Lord was with him, and because of that, he was a successful man and prospered in all he did. Um, So this guy says, you have control over my house. Um, I'm going to trust that good things are going to happen because I see that the Lord is with you. And good things do happen, but bad things come too. Um, Little attacks, the the man's wife um, tempts Joseph and then accuses him of, of trying to cheat on her husband with her. And Joseph ends up in prison. But prison walls don't stop God from being with Joseph. So we go to Genesis 39, 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Um, The keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his. So he now has favor with the prison guard. As, As someone who worked in juvenile detention, let me tell you, when you're in prison, there is nothing better than favor with the prison guard. It just doesn't get any better than that because the favor with the prison guard controls how quickly you get your, me- your mail. It controls whether or not you get extra food at your meal. Um, it controls whether or not you get a Benadryl to help you sleep at night. Um, favor with the guard in prison, that's, that's the stuff. If, if you gotta, if you got to go to prison, if, if you ever get persecuted for your faith to the point where you're in prison... <laughs> Trust that you're going to have God's favor with prison guards because that's, that's what you want in there. Um, so, so the moral of Joseph was, I am with you equals success in all you do, steadfast love, favor in the sight of your superiors. Um, King David. King David. This is a guy who knew that God was with him. Um, first, I want to tell a little story about a giant named Goliath that David went up against. And... It doesn't say that the Lord was with him, but David knew God is with me. He goes to King Saul and he says, listen, why are we we cowering in fear before this uncircumcised Philistine? The circumcision was David's knowledge of this is I have a covenant with God. The sign of that covenant is circumcision. This guy has no covenant with God. And then he tells the giant, you're an uncircumcised Philistine. What are you going to do to me? I have the the God, the army, the, the host... Lord of hosts, Lord Almighty, Lord of angelic hosts, fighting for me. You're big. <laughs> he takes five stones. He, he runs at this guy telling him, I'm going to cut your head off. He doesn't have anything sharp on him. He has five rocks. And he tells him, I'm going to cut your head off. Whizzes one of the rocks at his head. The giant falls down dead. And David takes the, guy, the giant's sword, cuts his head off. David knows God is with him. And the Bible backs it up. In 1 Samuel 18... 14 through 16, or 14 and 16. And I'm just putting these up here because I want you to see this over and over again. David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Verse 16. Therefore, when he, but all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. Um, so the Lord was with David, gave him military victory, and favor with all the people. Everybody loved David. Okay, um, Joshua. Joshua is the guy. Joshua is one of my favorite people in the Bible. Um, you got to know that God is with you if you're going to take over a city by walking around it 13 times. Um, there's something in you that says, okay, this is what God says to do. Let's do it because he's with us in this. Um, so the knowledge is there. The Bible confirms that indeed the Lord was with Joseph or Joshua. Um, chapter 6, verse 27. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. Um, his fame spread throughout all the country. So again, there's this, there's this and. The moral of the story from Joshua is when the Lord is with you, fame, your fame spreads throughout all the countryside. Okay, uh, Two more big ones we're going to look at real quick. Jeremiah 42 has an interesting story that I've never read before, and I was researching this. I had to read six chapters to understand it. Um, We're not going to go through six chapters here. Thank God for that. Um, But just a quick summary. This is during the Babylonian captivity. And 
there's a remnant of Judeans in the countryside who have not been taken into Babylon. The Babylonian king has placed a governor over them named Gedaliah. Um, Gedaliah brokered peace with the Chaldeans, who were a group of Babylonians who had it out for the Judeans. They're trying to kill them. And Gedaliah, um, Gedaliah brokered peace between them. While he was their governor, everything was cool, everything was kosher. He was, he was a good ruler to them. Um, they prospered while he was there. Um, there. He had an enemy, though, named Ishmael. And Ishmael wanted to come kill Gedaliah. Gedaliah didn't believe it. He thought Ishmael was his friend. Um, there was a, a leader of the Judeans named Johanna, Johanan. Johanan came to Gedaliah and said, Gedaliah, Ishmael is coming to kill you. Have nothing to do with him. Let me go attack him. Gedaliah says, no, you're speaking falsehood about my friend. I won't listen to it. Invites him into dinner. While they're at dinner, Ishmael stands up with his friends, killed Gedaliah. Um, he goes on this killing spree, kills some of the Chaldeans, kills some of the Babylonians, kills some of the Israelites. Um, there were some visitors from a neighboring countryside. Uh, he went out to meet them and said, yeah, come on in and see Gedaliah. As soon as they came in, he killed them. This guy was just murdering everything he could lay his hands on. Um, so the Judeans are, are freaking out a little bit. Um, Johanan has left, but Ishmael takes the remaining Judeans and he's going to take them all to Babylonian. No remnant left in the promised land, um, which is against what God wants. God has said, my, there will be a remnant of my people. Um, and he's trying to, to stop this. They run into Johanan. Ishmael freaks out. All the remnant goes back with Johanan and he leaves. The problem, though, is that the Chaldeans have showed up, and the Israelites now fear, fear the, the Chaldeans. They think, these guys are coming to get us. Now that Gedaliah is dead, there's no peace agreement between us, and so they're going to kill us, so we better hightail it to Egypt. Whenever the Israelites didn't want to face what was in front of them, hey, let's go back to the place where we were slaves for 430 years. Um, and God says, no, I don't want you going, going down there. Um, he says, listen, they go, to, they go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah gets the word of the Lord in chapter 42, verse 11 and 12. Do not be afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom you are afraid. Do not be afraid of him, says the Lord, for I am with you to save you and deliver you from the hand. But I will show you mercy that he may have mercy on you and cause you to return to your own land. If you, if you stay here and trust that I want you in this land, you're going to have my favor, you're going to have the favor of the Babylonian king, and I will save and protect you. Um, he says, however, and this is, this is an opposite side of having, having the Lord be with them. He says, if you go back to Egypt, I will not go back there with you. Um, in fact, I will go there against you. And the protection that you seek there, you will not find. I will hunt you down with the sword, with famine, and with pestilence, and the king of Babylon will come down and take over Egypt. So you think you're going to be safe there, but that's not happening. Sadly, um, our hero Johanan didn't, didn't want the Lord with them because he went back to Egypt. And sure enough, um, they were killed with the sword, with famine and pestilence, and the Babylonian king came in and took over Egypt, and they were all taken away anyway. So that's, the, that's not having the Lord with you. Um, but had they done what the Lord had said and had his presence with them, salvation, deliverance, mercy, mercy from your enemies, and a land to call your own. There's always an end. Um, one more major one we're going to look at, Haggai 1.13 and 2.4. Um, Haggai was a prophet of the Lord during the time when after the Babylonian exile, um, all the uh, Israel, not all of them, some of the Israelites were coming back and rebuilding Jerusalem, um, rebuilding their towns, and after a while the Lord says, where's my house? I'm looking around and you guys all have houses. Where's my house? And it's interesting, I don't think God cares about the house, except that for the Israelites, the house was where God was with them. The temple, for them, was where God's presence dwelt. Without that house, he wasn't with them. Um, I want to look at, at what the situation was in the land that the Lord describes through just a series of verses here in Haggai's just two chapters, um, and he, he addresses this all the way throughout. 
In verse 6, chapter 1, verse 6, he says, You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Um, everything that you touch, it just never works out right. Never works out right. Car's not working, you've got a hole in the roof. Um, not quite enough food. Can't get the food that you want. You're always thirsty. Um, you're alive, but just barely making it. Um, verse 1 9. He says, you looked for much, and behold, it came to little, and when you brought it home, I blew it away. Verse 10 and 11, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce, and I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and on all their labors. Whatever you put your hand to is going to be subpar in all things. Uh, chapter 2, verse 15 through 17, now then consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone for the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When once came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail. Verse 19, indeed the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded to nothing. So it's a pretty sad state of affairs, but there's good news for, for these guys under Haggai. The word of the Lord comes to them, and simply says, I am with you. Once they start building this temple for the Lord, he says, you're working on my house, I am with you here. Um, in chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, God says, yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, he was their leader. Um, be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the Lord. Work for I am with you according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. You don't have to fear when I'm with you. And let's see what's going to happen. In chapter 2, verse 7 through 9, he says, I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory. The silver is mine and the gold is mine. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, and in this place I will give peace. From this day on, he says in verse 19, I will bless you. So for the Israelites under, under the prophet Haggai, the moral of the story is, I am with you equals a reversal of fortunes. What was not quite enough becomes glory-laden blessing, and not even the glory that you're accustomed to, a greater glory. All the silver and gold is mine, and with it, I will bless you. Amen. Um, Jessica, I don't think we need to do these next verses. I'm just going to read through just a couple more of these. Um, Isaac. Um, Abraham's son lied about his wife, Rebekah, to um, King Abimelech. He said, this is, my, this is my sister, because like his father, he was afraid if they knew he was his wife, they would kill him so they could have her. Um, this caused his enmity with the king. The king finds out, man, you lied to me. I didn't do anything to you, and you lied to me about this. Um, he gets blessed anyway, but the king says, you got to get out of my land. He gets kicked out. Verse, chapter 26, verse 24 of Genesis says the Lord was with him. And when the Lord was with him, Abimelech comes to him, finds him out in the wilderness and says, hey, you know what? We need to make a covenant, you and I. And Isaac says, why do we need to make a covenant? You hate me. And he says, yes, but I see that the Lord is with you. Um, I am with you means you were blessed, your blessing gets passed on to your kids, and you find favor with your enemies. He was receiving blessing from from Abraham's blessing from God, because God was with Abraham. Um, in Judges chapter 1, uh, Joseph, uh, who, who was first over all of Egypt, um, his brother Judah, and then his children, they go out, they have military success, and they have land acquisition. They get lots of land because the Lord is with them. All of these are cases where it says, and the Lord was with them. In 1 Samuel 3, Samuel, the Lord is with him. And none of his words fell to the ground. He had wisdom, he had fame throughout all the land, and he was established as the Lord's man. Um, in 2 Kings 18, we see Jonathan. Um, and the Lord was with him, this is Saul's son, wherever he went, he prospered. He struck down the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory from watchtower to fortified city. Military conquest, because the Lord was with him. 
First Chronicles 9.20, Phinehas the priest. This is the one time where it doesn't say right there the Lord was with him and this happened, um, but it's in a long list of people. It's kind of like prayer of Jabez. You have this list of people, and then there's this little bit that God adds in in one name. And Phinehas says the Lord was with him. You go back and look at Phinehas' life. Because the Lord was with him, he twice turned the Lord's wrath and anger towards Israel away from them. Um, he had to kill some idolaters to do it, but he turned God's wrath away from the Israelites. So because God was with him, God couldn't even send his own wrath against them. Um, one last one, Second Chronicles 17, the Lord was with Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was a king of Israel. Um, Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand, and all Judah brought tribute to Jehoshaphat, and he had great riches and honor. His heart was courage, courageous in the way of the Lord, and furthermore, he took the high places in the ashram out of Judah. So the Lord being with, with Jehoshaphat meant he had riches, he had honor, he had courage, he had strength, he had success, and he accomplished the Lord's will. Amen. This is, as far as I can tell, that's every account of the Lord was with him or the Lord was with them or I am with you, says the Lord, in the Old Testament. This is what, this is what the disciples standing on this mountain with Jesus a couple weeks after he rose from the dead, is going through their minds when he says, I am with you. It's not simply, hey, how you doing? I'm not going to go away. I'll always be here to talk to you. It's, I am with you. Amen. And there was weight behind those words because every single case in the Old Testament of the Lord being with someone carried with it fame, success, land, um, accomplishment, military victory, protection, safety, there was never a time where the Lord was with somebody and there weren't blessings that shone forth from it. Amen. Amen. Um, give me a second here. Okay. New Testament. It only shows up four times. Two times it says the hand of the Lord was with somebody, and I think that's a different thing, so we're not going to look at those. Um, the first time not in book order, but in chronological order, is in John 16, 33. This is the, the Last Supper. Um, Jesus is given his disciples his, his last words before he goes to die and, and get resurrected. And he says in John 13, 33, little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I'm sorry, did I say 16? I meant 13. John 16, 33 is my favorite verse in the Bible, and so that just comes out. John 13, 33. He says, I am yet a little while I am with you. This is a sad I am with you. I'm, I'm not going to be with you for much longer. Um, Peter, you're about to deny me three, three times. Judas, you're going to betray me. You're going you're gonna to give me up for dead. Disciples, I'm only going to be with you a little while longer. This is, this is the sad one. Yet a little while, I am with you. Um, but then I'm dying. But he doesn't leave it there. He, he kind of tells them some things during this. He tells them he is going away, but he's coming back. He tells them the Holy Spirit is coming, and he prays for future believers. He eats with them, and he tells them he's leaving them his peace, and he predicts Peter's denial. Those things all happen in, in the final chapters of John as he's having this last, last supper. Um, but they're not seeing the victory in this. Um, it's, it's a dark time for them. What they're hearing is, I'm going away. Um, what they're hearing is, someone's going to betray him. What they're hearing is, Peter's going to deny knowing him. Um, it's not making sense. But he's not done. He does go away. He gets taken off to court. Um, they abandon him. He goes to the cross. He dies, and three days later, he comes back from the dead. And that brings us back to the beginning of, of this message. And we looked at, at some of the things he did when he came back, and they're an exact replica of the things he did in John. He announces that he's going to the Father and coming back. He tells them that the Holy Spirit is coming. He blesses future believers. He eats meals with them three times. He says, peace be with you three times. And he restores Peter three times. 
And he changes the phrase, yet I am with you, yet a little while I am with you, to Matthew 28, 20. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the only time in those 23 examples we looked at in the Bible where he says always. Always. He doesn't say I'm going away, but remember the good times that we had together. I am with you always. He doesn't say get really excited about 2012, guys, because... I'm going to come back, and things are going to be good then, because I'll be with you then. He didn't, by the way, come back in 2012. We didn't miss the rapture. Um, But he didn't say that. He didn't say, look forward to the future when I'm going to be with you. He says, I am with you always. He's about to leave, and his body's going into heaven, and he's telling them, I am with you always. Always, always, always. When the world is flooded and you're in an ark, I am with you. When you're in the pit of a lion and it wants to eat you, I am with you. When you're in a fiery furnace that's really, really, really hot and torching people who are just coming near it, I am with you. When you're eating, I am with you. When you're sleeping, I am with you. When you're witnessing, I am with you. When you're walking through tough times, I am with you. When you are about to sin, I am with you. When you've just sinned, I'm with you. When you come to me repenting, I am with you. When you're seeking my glory, I am with you. Um, When you're hanging out with your friends, I am with you. I am with you, always. When you're in slavery, when you're in captivity, when you're broke as a joke, when you're overflowing with wealth, I am with you. And these are the things that mean I am with you. Some of you are looking at me saying, but Brother Nate, you don't have all that stuff. It's true, but I'm getting there. And, and the Lord has shown me something about that. There's an expectation here of knowing that he is with us and, and, and really, really seeing that. When I went to, back to Hillsdale last year, um, things were tight financially, and there were was, there was some times where I did not see an answer. I'm like, Lord Jesus... I'm not, I, I, there's, there's no way I can do this. And then money would come in the mail. Um, sometimes it was one check that met the need exactly what it was. Sometimes it was four checks from four different people all showing up on the same day to meet, meet the need. And there were opportunities to have places to live taken care of. Like I was living in a pretty rough apartment. Um, the woman beneath me was a chain smoker. Um, and there were, there were literally people who would come visit and couldn't handle the smoke in my apartment because it was coming up through the vents and the walls from her apartment. Um, there was a teacher who was going on sabbatical and needed someone to watch over her house for three months. And I mean, how perfect is that for a 37-year-old who's back on, on a college campus? Not going to be throwing parties. It's a good person to have, but missed that one. Talked to the dean of men, and he said, yeah, maybe we can get you in as a, as a dorm parent, and you can help out in the dorms. Nope, sorry, we've just filled all those spots. Every single time it was like just missing the stuff that was going to make it easy and having to wait until the very, very last second to get the mean net or the need met. And I asked God, I said, what what happened with that year? Why was it like that? And he said, that's what you expected of me. I said, no. He said, yes, that's the kind of God that you expect that I am. And so with you, that's the kind of God that I am. Oh. Man, that stinks. That stinks bad. Um, in a journal one night, I was, I was having a hard time hearing from God. And a, a kid I was working with with Young Life um, wanted to know about Zephaniah. Like, what is this kid doing? He's barely a Christian and he's reading Zephaniah. Um, get out of here. So I figured I'm going to read Zephaniah and, and help him out and try and bring some understanding to him. Zephaniah 1.12 says, At that time, the day of the Lord, I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish those who are complacent, who are like wine left on its dreg, who think the Lord will do nothing, either good or bad. So when the Lord was coming back to Jerusalem during the day of the Lord, he's going to punish those people who aren't expecting him to be working. He expects us to expect him to be working. 
Um, why? Because he's with us. Paul said, I'm, I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. In other words, God is with me always. There's nothing that can separate me from him. He says again in Philippians, to me, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I live on this planet, Great. Christ is with me. That is Christ. He's going to be working through me. If I die, he's with me in an even better way. Either way, he is with me. He is with me always. So step out and know that he's with you. Know that he's with you. I didn't, when I went back to Hillsdale, I didn't hear a word saying it's time to go back. I, I knew it was what I, I should do, and I knew that God was with me. I couldn't have done it without him. There was no way. Um, we are in a beautiful building that we've been waiting for for years, and we've got this massive, massive plot of land over here in an area where churches aren't getting land, and, and, and God is with us. The Grebs started a school in less than six months because God was with them. He is with us always. You can get involved with local politics because God is with you. You can start a soccer ministry that touches hundreds of kids because God is with you. Wherever you go and whatever you do, he is with us always. He is with us always. Um, and that's all I got. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this in prayer. Father God, we just thank you so much for the sacrifice of your son on the cross. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins that you offer us through that. We thank you for coming back to life and knowing that you have conquered death and that when our bodies die, it's just a short thing and we will be resurrected bodily like you were. Father, we thank you for your great and glorious promise that throughout your word you said you are with us. And whenever you were with somebody, you brought blessing, you brought prosperity, and you brought success. You brought favor with their enemies, you brought favor with the common people, you brought favor with everybody. And Father, you have told us that you are with us always because Christ died on the cross and rose from the grave. So we just ask that you would keep that in our hearts and in our minds, that we would know that you are with us, that we would expect you to be with us, that we would expect you to work in our lives and work through us and work for us because you love us. We thank you for that love and we just ask you to continue helping us to grow as your children. Keep showing us how to live according to your word and the promises that you provide. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. I'm too. Worship team, come on back up. Ushers, if you'd attend to our folks. If you're a visitor here, you don't have to worry about being a part of our offering. But if you're a regular, we'd like to support, along with your tithe, there are places where we can give a gift to Brother Nate. And uh, I asked him the other day, how's the full-time job doing? And um, is it meeting the needs? And because Oakland Christian is in the early stages of their existence, the salaries for teachers aren't extravagant by any means. So anything that he's able to receive as a, as a blessing from harvest is gonna, gonna touch him. So we'll pray over that in just a minute. As you're preparing. We're going to prepare for a closing song as we finish up our service today. Everyone have an envelope that needs one? You can start playing, Joe, whenever. Let's pray over our giving. Father, I thank you for a great word that Jesus said to us as he was leaving in his ascension. And Lord, with how, we, how it was woven through the Old Testament and how Brother Nate brought it to us, we go from this place with the, the strength and courage 
because you're with us. Lord, thank you for this service today, and thank you for the ability to give into your kingdom, and even a special offering that we can give. We ask that you would bless. You are with us, which automatically means blessing, but we have to follow your plan as well. It can't just be what we want to do. We have to do what you want us to do. And as the willingness and the obedience link together, you cause us to eat the good of the land. In Jesus' name. Do you agree? Amen. Thank you. A few announcements as we close. The youth will have their service this week in the youth room, the, the adults on Wednesday. The ladies on Monday will pick back up after the Easter break. But especially three things happening on our calendar that are important, and one of them has to do with Saturday's classes for marriage. We encourage every married couple that can to be a part of Saturday morning at 9 a.m. We'll look for your email or some sort of correspondence that you can give us to let us know that you're coming. If you're a single or a divorcee and you just want to be in on the classes, feel free to enjoy that and come as well. Is this the first week of soccer? No, so it's one week after that. It's for the bigger ones. So at least we didn't coincide with the first week of soccer. That would have been bad. Because soccer is so much a part of the culture of Romeo right now. But we encourage you to be a part of this, our marriage seminar with the knowers. Our potluck is the 21st and a burn service on the 26th be exciting. As we sing this last song, you know, every time a song is written in the body of Christ and it filtrate, fil filters into our worship sets at ch different churches, some of them stick and some of them we never hear again because they just weren't meant to last. This song has been sticking in my heart, in my worship time. If you were here on Good Friday, this was one of the highlights of Good Friday service. So we want to share with you today. And then next week, our guest worship leader is going to be able to lead it as well. Do you have these words, Jess, to this song? I think you can find it from Friday, possibly. Just let the Lord minister to your heart through this.